on 28th of June 1914, Archduke Ferdinand, the heir to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, was assassinated in Sarajevo. Europe had been drifting towards armed conflict, and this was the final spark. By August, the various combatants were declaring war. Young Australians flooded the recruitment offices. Over 50,000 had enlisted by the end of 1914. Rupert Laidlaw was 21 when he joined the newly formed AIF in August 1914. In September, nurse Alice Kitchen joined the nursing service. Both were aboard the first convoy of Australian and New Zealand troops to set sail for Egypt. The convoy reached Alexandria in early December. The ancient monuments and cultures of Egypt were utterly different from anything they had experienced. For many volunteers, this seemed like an adventure in an exotic and mysterious land. But for Private Laidlaw and his colleagues, the war was about to get very real. On the 24th of April, he was aboard a troop ship approaching the Dardanelles. The next day, he was part of the vast Allied invasion force landing at Gallipoli. No lights were allowed when we got up. We heard the big guns booming, and in the distance we could see the battleships shelling the forts. Shrapnel was bursting everywhere and was making an awful row. Now we could also hear in the distance the rifle shots. They just sound like croaking frogs to me. At 5.30am, we were told to fall in quite prepared to transship to a destroyer, which we did at 6.15am. We are now on the way to the shore. The sea is very calm. We landed a few minutes later and we did get a hot reception. We lost a terrible number of men landing as the Turks were quite prepared for us. The country we are fighting in is awful. It's very mountainous and snipers get in amongst the trees and do their deathly work. Nurse Kitchen was stationed at the First Australian General Hospital in Cairo when the Gallipoli wounded began arriving. Treating so many severely wounded and dying men was a desolate business. Each day brought more reports of deaths of friends. 2nd of May 1915. We were sorry to hear that Lieutenant Lake had gone, but by this time perhaps all the men we looked upon as friends had been blotted out of this existence. Alice Kitchen found Egypt a strange and beautiful place, enabling momentary escape from the devastation of the war. 11th of May 1915. The morning star rises just outside one of our ward windows, and it and the morning light over the dry desert sand are lovely in the dawn, and makes up for the depression that is the usual accompaniment of night duty. I love this old Egypt so much, and shall be sorry to leave it, and always hope I may come back to it again. Jacaranda trees are in bloom everywhere, and look a delightful sight with their beautiful heliotrope flowers. I have never seen so many, or such fine ones, anywhere. I asked one man who came in from the front where he'd come from, and he said he thought it was from hell. I am afraid our losses have been heavy, and the lives lost too many for the positions gained. It seems such a reckless waste of useful human life. 30th of May 1915 Yet another very hot day and another glorious night. I wonder on what scenes of horror and death at Gallipoli this same moon looks down upon. How many broken lives and hearts all over this sad old world. The soldiers sought opportunities for activities that reminded them of home, even in the most dangerous situations. At Anzac Cove, they enjoyed swimming in the sea, even if it meant risking the dangers of the large Turkish gun, Beachy Bill. 2nd of September 1915. Went down with Harry to draw rations. Had a swim at the same time. Just as we were coming out, Beachy Bill opened fire with shrapnel. We all made a hurried exit for cover. One poor beggar caught one right through the heart and died immediately. He was a member of the 6th Battalion. Such is the irony of fate. This lad was alive and well a minute ago. Now he's dead. 
The majority of soldiers were young single men. For some of the older married men, it was as much the promise of a steady soldier's wage for a family that drove them to volunteer. My dear boys, when the boys come home, yes, I wish I was, but still we have a long way to go yet, I am afraid. Never mind, be good to your mother. Reg, my boy, if I am spared, we will work together. I shall get some work somewhere if I have to bike to work. I have got a clean sheet so far and my discharge papers ought to get me something. I mean what I say, your affectionate father. We don't know who wrote this postcard or whether he survived the war and returned to his family. Animals were also part of this war as the past met the mechanised future. The Australian Light Horse Regiments served in the Middle East and on the Western Front. Rupert Laidlaw's friend, Laurie, was devastated when his horse was badly injured and had to be shot. 23rd of March, 1915. Poor old Laurie. He told me that he cried for a long time afterward. You know it was his own horse that he had for over five years. And to make matters worse, they wanted him to shoot it himself. But he refused and he was paraded before the orderly room. But his officer got him out of it. Australian football was popular amongst the soldiers, and even in the most difficult conditions, it took them from the trenches and the war. Lieutenant Lionel Short, a former Argus journalist, described such a game in 1917 on the Western Front. The playing field was within shell range. Every inch of it had been won from the enemy by the hardest fighting, of which evidence lay all around. The centre was marked by two enormous shell holes, with two 5.9 shells, unexploded, lying beside a hand bomb at the bottom of one. Other shell holes lay towards the goalposts. Some damaged wire entanglement, a small mound, and a few half-filled sandbags assisted to complete the picture of warfare. But the saddest and most realistic touch of all lay behind the goalpost on the southern end. It was a small heap of earth, the grave of dead soldiers, with the simple but sublime superscription to unknown British heroes. A light fall of snow, fast melting in the warm February sun, lay on the ground. The melted snow made the ground as slippery as a banana skin. The obstacles impeded rushes, and the players themselves sadly lacked practice. But each member contributed something to that most astonishing match on that most astonishing ground. That night saw officers and sergeants again in the front line on a tour of inspection previous to another term of duty in the trenches. But it is certain that the game had given them fresh heart. It had carried their thoughts vividly back to those happy days when football was played in certain Melbourne suburbs they called home. And it is in such happy thoughts and memories that we soldiers live. The war initially greeted as an adventure by many, with promises of being home by Christmas, ground on year after year. Soldiers in their thousands were the weapons of war. As the casualty lists grew, the war became more and more divisive. Fewer men were volunteering and Prime Minister Billy Hughes was desperate to raise the troop numbers. In 1916, a plebiscite was held to decide whether conscription would be introduced. This precipitated fiercely fought political campaigns between pro and anti-conscriptionists. The 1916 plebiscite was narrowly voted down and a second plebiscite in 1917 was more decisively defeated. On 11th of November, 1918, the world was finally at peace with the signing of the armistice. For Nurse Alice Kitchen, the end of the war was met with a sense of relief as much as elation. Her thoughts quickly turned to all those lives lost. 12th of November, 1918. 
A great crowd everywhere, but not any wild hilarity. The tragedy of war still seems to lurk somewhere close in the background. We are still too near all the great sorrows and heartbreakings to feel great rejoicings, and one sees as many sad faces as merry ones. I feel more like weeping myself. For all their sacrifice, the world the soldiers came back to didn't seem better than the one that they had left. Many returned disillusioned and disturbed by the horrors they had endured. Statistics bear witness to the dreadful human cost of the conflict. Over 60,000 Australians were killed and 150,000 wounded. Many of the wounded bore significant disabilities. Many died prematurely. Each of these casualties were part of families and the ripples of sadness and loss stretched much beyond their own lives. Of course, there were also the impacts that were not manifestly physical. The ongoing trauma of the experience of the war was often lifelong. This is a medical record for a returned soldier who served in the First World War. He suffered no significant physical injuries, but his medical record runs to a thousand pages and a lifetime. Fortunately, Rupert Laidlaw, Alice Kitchen and Lionel Short all survived the war and lived full lives. Lionel Short won the Military Cross during the attack on Mont Saint Quentin, 1st of September 1918. He continued his career as a journalist. He died aged 87 in 1973. Rupert Laidlaw died in 1984, aged 90. And Alice Kitchen died in 1950 at age 77. Our library has a vast collection of material relating to World War I. We also have an extensive research guide that identifies the best resources both within our library and at other agencies.